We're going to look at chapter 26 still, and we're looking at part B of the reproductive system. We're going to look at the hormonal regulation of the male reproductive system, and it's going to involve a sequence of hormonal regulatory events that involve the hypothalamus, the anterior pituitary gland, and the testes. So this is called the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, or the HPG axis. It regulates the production of gametes and the sex hormones through three interacting sets of hormones. This begins with gonadotropin releasing hormone, which indirectly stimulates the testes via the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary. Follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are called gonadotropins and directly stimulate the testes. Testosterone or inhibin are produced in a negative feedback on the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary, and they are produced by the testes themselves. So the sequence of regulatory events begins in the hypothalamus, which releases gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Gonadotropin-releasing hormone travels to the anterior pituitary, where it causes the release of follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone then travel to the testes. Follicle-stimulating hormone causes sustenocytes to release ABP or androgen binding proteins, which will sequester a high amount or concentration of testosterone near the spermatogenic cells. This causes spermatogenesis. Luteinizing hormone prods the interstitial endocrine cells or Leydig cells to secrete the testosterone that is then going to be sequestered by the ABP or androgen binding protein. This also will help stimulate spermatogenesis. So the gonadotropins stimulate the process of meiosis in the male reproductive tract. So testosterone is a male androgen. It is going to be responsible for sex organ maturation and the development and maintenance of secondary sex characteristics and the male libido. Rising testosterone levels actually negatively feed back the hypothalamus and inhibit gonadotropin releasing hormone release. So they acts or it acts on the anterior pituitary to inhibit hypothalamus action in this HPG axis. Inhibin is also released when sperm count is high from the testes and inhibits not only gonadotropin releasing hormone, but follicle stimulating hormone release. It takes about three years to achieve balance in the HPG axis, and then testosterone and sperm production are made fairly stable throughout the life of the male. Without gonadotropin releasing hormones, or FSH and LH, which are the gonadotropins, the testes actually would atrophy, and this would cause sperm production and testosterone production to cease. So let's look or take a closer look at the hormonal regulation of testicular function. So again, this is the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal or HPG axis. So we're going to begin by looking at the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is in the brain. It's below the thalamus. It's connected to the pituitary gland via the infundibulum. Part of the infundibulum connects the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary, and it's this vascular connection that we're concerned with. So gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus is going to cause the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary. They will then travel via the blood to the testes. So follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are gonadotropins. So they're tropically going to travel and cause the release of more hormones, what a tropic hormone does. Follicle stimulating hormone acts on sustenocytes. It makes the sustenocytes release ABP or androgen binding protein. Androgen binding protein is able, able to sequester testosterone near itself or pull testosterone towards seminiferous tubules. So that's going to promote spermatogenesis. Testosterone though is being produced by interstitial endocrine cells or Leydig cells and that was being encouraged by luteinizing hormone. Testosterone is able to promote spermatogenesis as well, but again, it's going to be sequestered around the spermatogonia by ABP. Testosterone can also cause somatic and psychological effects at other body sites and the maintenance of secondary sex characteristics. High levels of testosterone inhibit the anterior pituitary from releasing its gonadotropins and also acts on the hypothalamus to release the or cause the inhibition of release of gonadotropin releasing hormone and inhibit produced by sustenocytes of the testes can also inhibit anterior pituitary and hypothalamic action. Testosterone is a steroid hormone synthesized from cholesterol. 
It'll be transformed to exert its effects on other target cells besides the testes. For example, it's transformed into dihydrotestosterone, or DHT, in the prostate, into estradiol in some neurons of the brain. But the main effect or function of testosterone in the testes is the promotion or prompting of spermatogenesis. It does target all accessory organs of the male reproductive tract, and it has multiple anabolic effects throughout the body, mainly on bone and muscle mass. It promotes actually an increase in those two tissues. A deficiency in testosterone we've talked about before leads to atrophy. So you would see both semen volume decline and sperm production decline. It also can impair erection formation and ejaculation, but is easily treated with testosterone replacement. Some male secondary sex characteristics, just to go through, Again, these are features induced in non-reproductive organs, but by male sex hormones. Again, that is mainly going to be testosterone as the male sex hormone. So it includes the appearance of pubic, auxiliary, and facial hair, auxiliary being in the armpits, the enhanced growth of chest hair, the deepening of the voice, so it affects the larynx. We'll see that skin thickens and becomes oily. This happens in females as well. So it's an effect that can also produce acne. We'll see anabolic effects. We'll see an increase in skeletal muscle and bone mass. So they're going to increase in density and in size. So it also boosts basal metabolic rate so it can affect other cells. And it's going to be the basis of the sex drive or libido in males. We also know that testosterone masculinizes the embryonic brain. And this continues to exert masculinization effects well into adulthood. The adrenal glands can produce androgens in small amounts, but we've noted that this is insufficient to maintain normal testosterone mediated functions. So it really is a testosterone amount produced by the testes that is able to masculinize not only the male body, but the male brain. We can see that a surge of testosterone occurs after fertilization before birth, a small surge after birth, and then right at puberty, we'll see another surge and we'll get adult levels produced for a number of years before it declines after about age 70 to 80. And now we're finally going to look at the female reproductive anatomy. So the female gonads are the ovaries. The ovaries produce gametes. The gametes for the female reproductive tract is ova or a singular ovum. And we both have endocrine and exocrine functions for the female reproductive anatomy. So not only are we producing gametes, we're also gonna be secreting female sex hormones from the ovaries. These include estrogen, also known as estradiol, estrone, or estriol, and progesterone. The accessory ducts of the female reproductive system include the uterine tubes, uterus, and the vagina. The internal genitalia for the female reproductive tract, so inside the pelvic cavity, is the ovaries, uterine tubes, uterus, and vagina, and we'll also look at the external genitalia or the external sex organs. So here is a side or sagittal view of the internal organs of the female reproductive tract. We can see part of the ovary kind of hidden. We can see the finger-like projections of the uterine tube called the fimbriae. We can see the infundibulum of the uterine tube and then the rest. You may know the uterine tube as the fallopian tube. We can see superiorly the uterus. Inferiorly at the uterus we have the cervix. And the most inferior structure here internally is the vagina. So the ovaries are going to be held in place by several ligaments, including the ovarian ligament, suspensory ligament, and mesovarium. These ligaments themselves are a part of a suspensory ligament, kind of broad ligament. And altogether, the broad ligament contains support for uterine tubes, uterus, and the vagina. So here we can see the broad ligament which contains, for example, parts of the spensory ligament, the mesovarium, mesometrium, and it's supporting structures of the internal reproductive organs for a female. We have a better view of the entire female reproductive system. So here we have two ovaries. One's been cross-sectioned. The uterine tubes, also known as fallopian tubes, don't actually touch the ovaries, but they do have on the end here, the ovaries, these finger-like projections called fimbriae. And then the fimbriae proceed to the ampulla of the uterine tube. And the ampulla will then narrow further. And where the fallopian tube touches the uterus, it narrows. And this is actually the isthmus of the uterine tube. Then we have the uterus. 
The part of the uterus above where the fallopian tubes reach laterally, this domed region, that's going to be the fundus of the uterus. Then you have the body of the uterus. And then we have the isthmus or the narrow region. And then kind of the more inferior portion is the cervix. There is an internal opening of the cervix and an external opening of the cervix. The external os is near the vagina. The internal os is near the isthmus of the uterus. The most inferior structure is the vagina. And then we just briefly want to mention the three layers of the wall of the uterus, the innermost being the endometrium, the middle muscle being the myometrium, and the outermost layer being the perimetrium. So next we're going to talk more about the ovaries and look at their blood supply and look further at the female reproductive system.